Great to have you with us today. We're looking forward to a great time in the Lord, excellent time of fellowship. We've got a lot of really cool things planned. Uh, and believe it or not, I think God has even more in store than the things that we've been thinking about. And uh, so we're excited to see how the Lord is going to work and move and meet with us in this place this morning. But we're glad that you have met with us. We're so glad that you are bringing the church into these four walls. You know, uh, during the week, this is just brick and wood. It's not the church. It, is, uh, it becomes the church when the church enters into it. And you have brought the church with you this morning, and we're so thankful for that. Good to see you with us this morning. I told Jimmy, he was sitting in the back this morning, I was like, I miss you up front. But uh, we're going to sing a lot, we're going to learn about the Lord. And I'm going to invite you to just stand with us this morning as we begin in worship. Singing a song that you're familiar with, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee.
identity in you, that we are loved by you, Lord, that you call us your own, you've named us as your children, and you desire for us the very best. And Lord, you speak your truth into our lives that we would respond to it and hear to it in the words of love that come to our hearts. That it would change the way we live and move and interact with one another. That we would find our joy in you. Lord, be honored in this place this morning and all that's said and done we ask that you would fill this place with your Holy Spirit. You are welcome here this morning. We honor you and love you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. You know, I really appreciate the fact that God's favorite music is the kind that's done in spirit and in truth. And uh, it's just so glad, it's so awesome to be able to gather as a church family and worship him together. Welcome. I'm Pastor Lonnie. I'm the uh, pastor of outreach here at Forsy, and it's so glad to see you. I'm so glad you're here. If you're a guest with us here, I want to just say, again, welcome. I want to point you to a visitor's card that is in the pew in front of you, just on the bottom there. And on the one side, you can see there's a place to write your name and address. And this is so that we can give you information, um, so that we can kind of tell you a little bit about who we are, and you can tell us a little bit about who you are and what you're looking for, and uh, we can help connect the dots for you. That's what we really want to do. And so um, go ahead and fill that out. When the offering plate comes by, you can drop it in. On the back side, and this is for everyone, not just our guests, but uh, there's a place to fill out a prayer request and let us know how we can be praying for you. And again, when the offering plate comes by, you can drop that in. There's a couple of... Uh, announcements that I want to share with you. The major one is that there is a ministry workshop coming up very soon, uh, September 8th, right? September 8th from 9 to noon. It's the 3D gospel. If you are a teacher here, uh, and one of our Sunday school teachers, or if you are uh, a, a leader here, you're required to come to this. This is something we want. This is all hands on deck, but it's for anybody who would like to come as well. Um, it's helping us understand how to present the gospel and to do ministry in contexts where people have different worldviews, different ways of thinking. I'll just give you a, a short example. Like one of the things you'll learn about in 3D gospel is honor shame cultures. Uh, for example, there like. Uh, many cultures in Asia are honor shame cultures and someone was telling me she was trying to share the gospel with someone from China and she was uh, talk trying, she was at the point where she was trying to explain that you have sin and you're a sinner and you know Jesus died so she's talking from a guilt and innocence perspective but the lady was listening from an honor shame perspective and she had a hard time accepting the fact that she had sin and and then uh, the, my friend remembered, oh, that's right, honor, shame. Um, have you ever brought dishonor uh, uh, on yourself or your family? Have you ever brought shame to yourself and your family? Oh, yeah, I, I completely identified. And then took the, the step to say, well, you know, the Bible says that all of us have brought shame and dishonor uh, on ourselves, and we've dishonored God, and that's not okay. And it was able to then continue the gospel because that's just how she, she was thinking. So that's the idea. Is, and we live in a culture that's so diverse, so many different cult, uh, and so many different cultures around us, and we want to be able to minister to people in a way that speaks their language. And so this ministry workshop is going to help with that. Another thing that I want to highlight is that, uh, if you remember, we are a partnership church for International Students Incorporated, ISI, at University of Maryland. And we uh, go on Friday nights, uh, uh, one Friday night a month to bring dinner, to be conversation partners, to help with Bible study. And so this Friday night, August 31st, is the first one, and uh, we need people to sign up for that. And so you can contact Ann Hunt, um, and the information's there in your bulletin. We'd love for you to go ahead and sign up for that. There are other things here, you can read them, see them, keep your bulletin in front of you, put it on your fridge, look at it so that you know what's going on here at Forsey. 
One thing that's going on, though, and this is really exciting in our house, I'm sure it is in your houses as well, school's about to start, right? For Forest View Christian School, we start tomorrow. And I want to invite Pastor Mike and Sherry and to come on up. Um, I don't know if DeHaven is, is with us this morning. Can you come on up and uh, tell us a little bit about that? Well, it is exciting. School is starting. I've had the privilege of being part of some of the orientation. What a great week of orientation Sherry planned for the staff. And, and uh, it's the 42nd year, I think, of Forsey Christian School. So... 24th, 24th year for the middle school, I think, is about to start. And for me, it's my first year sending some of my kids to Forsey Christian School. I'm so excited and blessed by that. And Sherry's been around the school for about 25 years now already. But this will be her first year officially, officially as the hired principal of Forsey Christian School. So we just got to keep clapping. Mr. DeHaven Scott is uh, the assistant principal this year. We've been getting to know him as well. But Sherry, would you just share for a minute kind of what's on your heart as you go into the school year? Sure. I just wanted to share our theme for the year. It's Be Wise, Be the Most, Be the Difference, and it's uh, based on Colossians 4-5. Um, be wise in the way you act toward outsiders, making the most of every opportunity. So we're just going to be really purposeful this year in our chapel and the teachers in the classrooms about talking to students about making wise decisions making the most of the opportunities they have to share their faith, to be Christ-like, um, and just to serve and to love others. And um, so we just really appreciate your prayers for Forsey Christian Schools. We start tomorrow. And already God's answer in prayer. I know last couple Sundays we've been praying for the enrollment, and enrollment has just shot up quite a bit even this past week. So we can continue to pray that way, but I know Sherry is very encouraged by that. So uh, we are going to pray. We're going to pray right now. Mike and Lonnie are going to help me here to pray uh, over Sherry, but would any school staff or volunteers, including school board members, teachers, volunteers, would you stand right now? Because we want to pray for you as well. So stand on up. I know you're out there. Don't be shy. Um, we want to pray for these individuals that have some kind of significant role in the school. And this is not just three guys on stage praying, all right, church? This is every heart engaged in prayer. We need that much prayer all right, to come before the Lord today uh, on behalf of these that are standing and so many more. So uh, would you join us in prayer? We're going to put our hand here on Sherry. Would you extend your hand in the direction of someone that you see standing up or if nowhere else, up here toward us? And let's just let those prayers flow. Let those prayers flow. So, some of you guys are asking for extra ones, and that's good. But uh, let's, let's go before the throne. Heavenly Father, thank you so much. We are here with anticipation for the school year ahead. We thank you, Lord, for your provision for 4 Christian School for 42 years, Lord. What you begun, you are continuing. You have been faithful to preserve. You are, have just continued to bless, Lord, so many lives that have come through this school. And um, we just want to pray uh, for the, the focus and the vision for this year, Lord. And part of it is to be wise, Lord. We know that you are the source of all wisdom. Father, we look to you your word and your revelation for that wisdom. I want to pray, Lord, for um, Sherry and DeHaven as, as principal and assistant principal, Lord, for the school board, for the teachers especially, Lord, that they would seek you with all for your wisdom, Lord, in every situation, Lord, uh, for all of the volunteers and everyone associated with the school, Lord, that we would feel that this is a building, this is a school where your wisdom is experienced and felt in the hallways, in the classrooms, and Lord, even going home with the students to their families. We thank you that you're the source of all wisdom, and we pray that this year would be a growth in that wisdom. In Jesus' name. Our Father, I just continue and ask as well that you would give each teacher, each staff member, each uh, student a blessing to See, and discernment to make the most of every opportunity, Lord, that is presented to them. For the teachers, that they would make the most of every teachable moment in their classroom and outside of the classroom, Father, that you would give them special discernment and a nod, a nod from your spirit to say, this is a divine appointment. That one has trouble going on at home, speaking to his life. This one is, is dealing with some self-esteem, some 
encourage her, build her up, Lord. I pray, Father, that you would uh, do this for each teacher, each staff member, each student as well, Lord. Help them to realize the gift that they have to be sitting under the, the discipleship, the tutelage of these teachers, Lord. And I pray that they would uh, make the most of every opportunity to learn, to ask questions, to grow. Father, that you would uh, cause them to go beyond what, uh, what uh, they might think that they can do, Lord, in order to bring glory and honor to you, bring people to Christ because of it. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And Father, would you just make a difference? Would you just enable uh, this staff, this team, to be the difference that these students and their families need? To be the difference that only Christ can bring. Lord, would you even make this whole school just a, a difference maker in our community? Lord, that we be known for the difference that you bring to lives, the difference that you bring to education, Lord, the difference that you bring to families and neighborhoods. Lord, would they be the difference, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And we have a video just to show appreciation for our wonderful Corsi Christian staff, and we'll show that as the offering goes. <laughs>
Mr. DeHaven Scott just came. Hey, would you come down real quick? DeHaven is our assistant principal at Forsey Christian School. He was serving hard at his church at New Orleans over this morning. He is here with his lovely family, and we cannot miss the chance to pray for him as well. Let's pray. Lord, we pray for DeHaven. We thank you for him. Lord, we thank you for uh, just the connection that the school board was able to make with him and be with them and just the confidence that, that was expressed, Lord, that uh, it was the right fit. It was the right time for him to come and to bring his leadership to our school. I pray you would bless him with great partnership with Sherry and the rest of the staff. Give him wisdom to make the most of every opportunity to be the difference you've called him to make. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, our 4C teachers are making a difference. You can tell it in the lives of those kids, can't you? that uh, they're getting good influences and the Lord is working in their lives. And we're so grateful uh, to Haven to have you on board. It's been great getting to know you. I know that there's a lot more memories to be made in the, in the weeks and years to come. We want to teach you a, a, a new song. And I want to tell you just a little bit about uh, the kind of the background of the, of the idea here. The song is called New Wine. And uh, in three of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus teaches using this illustration. And he says, you know, you can't put new wine in old wineskins. And that was something that everyone understood back then, but you, you might not have a big context for understanding that. You see, when, when they made wine, they had skin of goats that they would sew together into a container and they'd put the... The, the juice in there and then they'd add yeast and they'd seal it all up and the yeast would eat the sugars in the in the juice and start the fermentation process and carbon dioxide would be released into the into the uh, into the sack the the, the wine container the, the the skin and and the the wine skin would bloat it would get real big it would stretch and so they needed to use skin that hadn't stretched yet. They needed skin that was young and, and it, could, it could just expand. Um, but once that had happened, once that process had taken place and the skin had stretched, you couldn't use it again to make wine because it had already stretched, right? It had already been through that process. So you just used it and, you know, when, it, when the wine was ready, you'd dump it out and then throw that away and then you'd have to get a new wine skin so we could do what it needed to do. I've been around the church for a while, and I've actually heard people use this illustration to say, you know what, um, if God's going to do something new, he can't use the same old people to do what he wants to do. If he wants to do a new thing, he needs new wineskin. And so whether that meant, like, you can't teach an old dog new tricks, you know, you, we need to, that's not at all what Jesus meant. And you know how I know that? Because in Revelation 21.5, in the book of Isaiah, there's all different places through Scripture where Jesus proclaims, Behold, I make all things new. I make all things new. Anything that anyone who wants to be ready to receive from me, they will receive a new heart. I can take a heart of stone and turn it into flesh. I can make all things new. So if you want to be a part of receiving the blessing of the Lord, you can say, Lord, I'm ready for you to make me new, work a new thing in my life, make me fresh to be able to receive the blessing of new wine. Oh, that he would do that and that he would begin today making us new to receive the blessing of his Holy Spirit. Amen. Hear these words. In the crushing, in the pressing, you are making new wine in the soil I now surrender you are breaking new ground so I kneel to you into your careful hands when I trust in you I don't need to understand Oh! 
Just what God wants that, that we've been hearing about in these letters to the churches in Revelation. So I lay down my old flames to carry your new fire today. I think that's exactly what his message was to Laodicea last week, right? They were lukewarm. You need some new fire. You need some new fire, church. And I, I think that really fits that line, old flames, new fire, could fit really with, with every church that he's addressed that we've looked at in this series. And I think it kind of relates to what God is doing here in our church, in 4C Bible Church. And I know it's at least something uh, that we resonate with as a staff because we had this great staff retreat this week. Look at those handsome guys. Um, spent about 30 hours together. And let me tell you, it was powerful and it was productive. Like, it was really productive. And we're so excited to seek the Lord about what He wants to do in our lives and in our church family. And we started with just taking some time personally to read back through Revelation chapters 2 and 3, the series we've been in, and to think, how does God want to speak to us personally? And we even kind of outline, you know, following the outline in the letters, there's a clear outline in these letters. Jesus always starts with kind of a revelation of himself, who he is, and then he rejoices in something that they're doing, and he rebukes them for something that they're doing, and he kind of declare some rewards for them. And so following that outline, we kind of wanted to capture what we thought Jesus was saying to us personally. And we each wrote a letter to ourselves, trying to capture what, you know, we felt like the Lord was speaking to us from his word during the season. And then we read those letters to each other. It was powerful to pray for each other. It's, it's powerful when you don't just hear the word, but you try to become doers of it. That's God's heart for his church. 
that we wouldn't just hear the word, but we would respond and, and do the word. Let's read James 1. You see it here in James chapter 1. Let's read this aloud together. Do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. You can understand God's heart, especially if you're a parent, because as a parent, we can't stand it when we ask our kids you know, to do something, and they hear it, and they don't do it. You know, for example, child, please take out the trash. And child says, okay. And ten minutes later, the trash is still there, and the child is still on the couch. Not that that ever happens in our house. Maybe in some of yours. But you say, child, I told you to take out the trash. And child says, I know, I heard you. That doesn't work, right? Is it just... Is that just for me that that doesn't work? Not that that ever happens in our house, ever. But I'm glad you heard me. Now go do it. (laughs) Go do what I'm calling you to do. That is so much of God's heart for us. That we wouldn't just hear the word and forget. That we would respond. That we would do what he's called us to do. We have heard so much of what he said. Maybe you've heard all seven messages that we've done on these letters to these churches in Revelation, churches located in Asia Minor that hear directly from Jesus in the book of Revelation. We've heard what God says to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. He says things like, love again, you win, come alive, draw the line, well done, open the door. We've looked at what Jesus says to his church, and every letter has closed with, Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You hear God's heart? It's not just hear with your ears. It's if you've got ears and you've heard, come on, do something about it, right? Like really hear in a way that makes a real difference in your lives. And so here's all we want to do today is just take some extra time. Because so often we rush, you know, done with one series, jump into the next one. We just want to hit the pause button, all right? We just want to take some extra time to remember what we've heard Jesus say. And to give our hearts a chance to respond to what the Spirit of God is asking us to do. So we're going to kind of weave together some of God's Word that we've heard and some songs. And and just try to give you a chance through hearing His Word again and responding to do what the Spirit of God is asking you to do. So some other pastors are going to be helping me with that this morning. But first we've got to pray and ask for God's help above anything else. Let's pray. Lord, would you help us to be not just merely hearers but doers of your Word? to remember the things that you've been speaking to our hearts, and Lord, in our hearts to take action in what you're calling us to do. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Who has, in the last few weeks, received a letter in the mail from a company that's trying to introduce you to their product or service? Who's received a letter recently? Okay. So we've received a letter, Katie and I, and, you know, you get these different letters and you open them up and, you know, you start to read it and it says, Dear Mr. and Mrs. Maslin, in our case, and then I take a step back and I say, that's my parents, but no, okay, Dear Mr. and Mrs. Maslin, this is you, all right. Hello, my name is Melissa from ABC Insurance Company, uh, and we wanted to write you to let you know that we are the leader in insurance sales. We have been around for 80 years We are reliable, have a great customer service team, and we are ready to help you with your insurance needs. And then it goes on from there to share what, you know, what their services are, et cetera. Okay, does that sound familiar? That sound familiar? They're introducing, before they tell you their thing, they're introducing who they are, and as they say who they are, that tells you about them. You know, in the churches of the Revelation, here these seven churches, Jesus always begins by introducing an aspect of who he is. And so I just wanted to review um, some of those phrases that Jesus is saying about himself. He was saying to to the seven churches, I established you. He says, I walk among you. He says, I am the creator and sustainer of all things. He says, I died and rose again for you. He says, I carry a sharp, piercing sword. My eyes are like a blazing fire, and my feet are of burnished, brilliant bronze. I am holy and so far above and beyond you 
in my nature. I am God. I am true and fully correspond to true reality. I am the amen. I am faithful and I am the ruler. He's saying all these things about himself that informs us who he is before he gives us his different instructions. And just as Melissa from ABC Insurance Company wants to highlight the top three things that she wants to get across, that they are experienced, that they're reliable, and that they are ready to help you, in the same way Jesus is highlighting, as we look, you know, kind of summarize these church letters to the churches, three attributes that he wants us to get. And you can write these down if you like. The first is that Jesus is holy. He is holy. We think of that as an old-fashioned word, but holy means altogether separate from us. He is so far above and beyond us. 1 Timothy 6.16 uh, is a great verse to describe this. It says that he's the king of kings and the lord of lords. He is alone is immortal and dwells in inapproachable light. Jesus is holy. And he's emphasizing, highlighting that for the churches. Another thing, that Jesus is faithful. Jesus is faithful. He keeps every one of his promises. Nothing that he has said or will say that won't be lost in his memory. He keeps his promises. So Jesus is faithful. He's holy. He's faithful. And the third one that he was really highlighting to the seven churches is that Jesus, that he is with us. He's with us. He walks among us. He sees us. And that's the thing that really struck me was, you know, Jesus is holy. He's altogether separate, perfectly righteous. And yet he also dwells among us. They're Jesus Christ, but he sees and he cares and he is with us in the same way as Hebrews 4.13 reminds us that nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. So Jesus is holy. Jesus is faithful. And Jesus is with us. His attributes that he wants us to make sure that we understand about him. And as we sing this next song, I want to invite you to think about those attributes, one of those attributes that sticks out and, you know, is confronting you the most about who he is so that we can relate rightly to him. Let's continue in worship.
brokenness and carries me when I am frail and weak. Jesus, it is you. Oh, no, tell the storm to rest when I am overwhelmed and cannot speak. Jesus, it is you. in his hand who takes my thoughts and fears and hangs them on the arms of Calvary Jesus it is you my Jesus it is you please stand and sing this chorus with us
be seated. We all have plans for our children. You know, when they're young, we, we see them way into the future, all the things they can be and all the things they can do. And, um, but yet, you know, it's the little things in life that are the milestones that kind of keep us going. I remember when my girls first walked. You know, it was, you could see it coming. They were kind of cruising around the, all the furniture and they were looking at the open space and then all of a sudden it happened. You know, they took that step towards your open arms and, and you rejoiced. It was so exciting, it was great. Um, but we knew there was so much more coming. Uh, there was so much more they needed to conquer and to have victory over. Um, you know, one of the things that, you know, I was reminded of, you know, the young life is just, uh, you know, my granddaughter brought a picture to me after school, Forsey Christian School, and uh, it was like, this was the first picture that kind of made sense to me. Uh, you know, it, it, I could see the details in it, and, and uh, it, it, you know, it was just good. And so we rejoiced over that. It was fun, and it was hanging up in my office. And here's the picture uh, right here. I have to change it. There. And, you know, you could see the shark eating the jellyfish. And uh, you could see the heart right in the middle of the ocean. And, and my favorite part is the sunshine just kind of peeking right at the shore. Uh, but we rejoiced over that. And I know that she's going to do greater things than that. You know, that's my desire of my heart and the hope of my heart. But one of the things, you know, that God is, you know, in this uh, two chapters of Revelation, the seven churches, he repeats seven times, I know this about you. I know this about you. Uh, he, he's aware of it, and he starts rejoicing in the things that they have done well. You know, he says, I rejoice in your service. I rejoice in your faith. I rejoice in your love. I rejoice, you know, in the fact that I know where you live and, and you have little strength and yet you're, you're holding true. You're not giving up. And I rejoice in that. Um, you know, Jesus is, is kind of looking for the good things in their life. And he's saying, I know that you've done this and you've done this and this is great and I'm excited and I want to rejoice with you and celebrate that. Uh, but I know there's so much more that you have to master and so much more you have to conquer. But I want to rejoice in those things now. You know, in, in, in 1 John it says, you know, behold, what manner of love is this, you know, that Jesus loves us, that his banner over us is love. And I kind of translate that as Jesus wants to put the good things we do on his refrigerator and, uh, you know, and celebrate with people and say, and look what my child has done. You know, look at my beloved, and, and, and they're, they're mastering this. They're having victory in this, and, and I'm rejoicing in that, but I know they're going to do greater things. Uh, Zephaniah 3.17 says this. It says, the Lord your God is in your midst. The mighty one will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. And he was looking forward to the restoration of the remnant of Israel that had, had proven themselves faithful. And he says, you know, God's going to rejoice over you over and over and over again with loud singing. I didn't do that for my kids, you know, so. But God's going to do that for us. Loud singing. He's going to rejoice. He's in our midst and, and he's walking with us and he's watching our victories. And so we need to be reminded that God sees and knows. Uh, and he wants to put our victories up on his refrigerator. And the question that I will leave with you is, what is the one thing that God would put on his refrigerator, you know, that you're doing right now? What is the thing he's celebrating, that step of faith that you've taken toward him, running toward him with open arms, even though it seems so hard? What's the victory? Just as we think about our God as a God who sees it, reminds me of Psalm 33. Uh, I really love this Psalm 33, 13, where it says, The Lord watches from heaven. He sees all people. From the place where he lives, he looks carefully. 
at all the earth's inhabitants. I was wondering, does he really does he really see me and know me and see what's going on? And he says, he is the one who forms every human heart and takes notice of all their actions. How encouraging is that to know this God who knows us and sees us, he's taking note of all of our actions. That's really encouraging when you're walking with the Lord. But when you are going astray, when you're off the path and having your wilderness experience, that is that can be a fearful thing because Jesus brings his rebuke. And that's one of the things that we're going we're gonna to see in Revelation that we've been looking at uh, in these letters is that Jesus brings the rebuke and we see that he is not messing around when it comes to sin in the life of his church. He brings the rebuke. We, we, he's looking at this church and he sees a group of believers who have departed from their first love in Ephesus, right? They've departed from their first love. He sees a group of believers who, are jump, who have jumped headlong into idolatry and sexual immorality in chapter 2 there, right? Uh, Pergamum and Thyatira. He looks at a church, a group of believers, people who profess Christ, who he says, you are dead. And for those of you who are not fully dead yet, you're almost dead, right? You, you have no good deeds. This was the church of Sardis. And he, he looks at Laodicea, he says, you believers there, right? He's talking to believers. He says, you think you are so good. You think you're rich and you think you've got everything going on, but you're wretched and you don't even realize it. And you're poor and you're blind and you're naked. You're lukewarm and your behavior is absolutely disgusting to me. This is Jesus, tender Jesus, meek and mild, right? Bringing the rebuke into his people. And, you know, maybe you're here today and, you know, you don't have the same fire and passion for God that you used to. What does he have to say to you? The Spirit of Christ is calling you out this morning. Maybe you're here today and you, you haven't gotten past idolatry. And maybe, I know it's not you bowing down to a little idol or statue or something, but idolatry is beyond that, right? You know, we so easily give ourselves to lesser things. And maybe you're here today and you find yourself giving the best of who you are, all your excitement and enthusiasm to toys and celebrities and games and sports teams and things that were created perhaps for our pleasure. But we've taken that, which should be a tool for worshiping God, and we've worshiped the thing created rather than the creator. If that's you this morning, he's calling you out. Maybe you're engaged in sexual immorality, and you're justifying it. Or you've resigned yourself to it, like, this is just what I do. It is what it is. I've been in this for so long, there is no end. There's no hope for me. And you believe that lie, that you're in too deep. The Spirit of Christ is calling you out this morning. Or maybe you're like what George Bar Barna refers to as the casual Christian. Listen to what he says about people who are, are casual Christians. He says their faith, they have faith, but it's in moderation. Don't, they don't feel compelled to prioritize or heavily invest themselves in their faith. They're primarily driven by their desire for happiness, safety, comfort, and they pursue this rather than uh, pursue what God wants for them. Being, they, they think that you know, being religious enough is good enough. They just want to be a nice person, be kind, don't kick cats and dogs. You know, and but but and, and have good character, but without having to publicly defend or represent difficult social or moral positions. Listen, if this description of Christianity represents you, Jesus is calling you out this morning. And what I want you to realize is that he says that everyone who follows him must pursue him with a wholehearted devotion, unrestricted obedience. No crossing the line. No resigning yourself to sin and saying, well, God will forgive me anyway. It's not a big deal. Because when we do that, when we hold back or when we don't go far enough to do what he says to do, he brings the rebuke. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And Christ commands us to respond to his voice 
with this obedience that says, I'll do whatever you say. I'll, I'll go wherever you want me to, to go. You want me to love my enemy? Sure, I'll love my enemy. I'll do whatever you say, even at great personal cost. And see, he's not going to let his people continue to live in unrepentant sin. He calls us to that level of Christianity. And I want you to understand that that's not advanced Christianity. That's not like Christianity for the elite. That's day one Christianity. We're called to follow Christ wholeheartedly from day one. He's not going to tolerate it when we live with these sin patterns day in and day out. He says, all those I love in 319, all those I love, I rebuke and discipline. Listen to what he threatens. He says, he's going to remove your lampstand from its place. He says, I'm going to make war against those people with the sword of my mouth. He says, I'm going to throw you onto a bed of violent illness. This is Jesus speaking. Terrible suffering is in store. He says, I'm going to strike you with deadly disease. And in 2.23, he says, I will repay each one of you what your deeds deserve. In 3.3, he says, I'm going to come like a thief against you. So the question is, what is it going to be? As we sing this next song about surrender, I want you to reflect on these questions on the, the screen. Jesus sees you. He knows you. He loves you. And there's things about you that he wants to celebrate. What are those? Those are things that you have in your life because of his grace. Give him glory. Give him praise for that. But also listen to his rebuke. What things in your life does he want to correct? What things in your life does he want you to change? Write them down. Reflect on those things and surrender them to him. we doing? Doing all right? Quite a ride this morning, right? I think that last segment was really key, where he rejoices and he rebukes, because isn't it so true that often 
we who already feel so guilty and so awful, you know, are the, are the ones that need to hear that he rejoices over us? We, we tend to hear the rebuke part loud. <laughs> but I hope you hear that rejoice part loud. And isn't it also true that we who think we kind of got it all together, like, we just love to hear that rejoice part, but often we're the ones that need to hear that rebuke part loud. <laughs> isn't it neat how God knows how to speak to each one of us? But make sure you're not just listening for what one we want to hear, but our hearts are inclined to hear most naturally. He wants to speak to all of us exactly what we need to hear. He wants to reward his church. That's part of the outline, if you're still following along on the back, that you know, each of these churches, Jesus promises a reward at the end. I, I see the rewards in three kind of categories. In these seven churches, I, I see rewards related to the security that he wants his people to know. He says, you're going to eat from the tree of life in paradise to the church of Ephesus. He says, you're, you're not going to have to fear the second death. You're not going to be harmed by death, he says to Smyrna. Then he wants us to know that we're secure in him through our faith. He rewards us with an intimacy that he promises to us by, by our faith. That He says to Pergamum, there's a white stone and it's going to have your name on it. And he says something similar to Lyle or to Philadelphia. There's going to be you know, names that he's going to give us, one name that only he's going to know. There's just this intimate way that we get to know him you know, when we walk by faith. And then there's the rewards he gives in terms of authority. And I don't know if you heard these loud enough when we were talking to, to Thyatira, the church of Thyatira said, you're going to rule over nations. It said to Laodicea, you're going to sit on my throne. Isn't that kind of interesting? I mean, my kids love when they come into my office and get to sit in daddy's chair. Like, God kind of says, you're going to sit in my chair. You're going to have some kind of authority come. Like, these are rewards that he wants us to know, that he wants to bless us with as we put our faith in him and walk by faith in him. Which which reward promised by Jesus most excites you? Write it down. Write it down. For me, I think it's sitting in daddy's chair. I just love that idea. I don't fully know what it means, but I love that he wants me to sense and to feel what he, a little bit of what he feels in that moment. The last thing that he wants for each of his church, he restores his church. Jesus restores his church. And if you haven't written anything else down yet, write this down. Repentance is the key to restoration. Repentance is the key to restoration. There's five churches where I think he really wants them to repent. Four, he specifically uses the word repent because he wants to restore them, but there's no shortcut to restoration, to a renewed relationship with God. Sometimes we think, if I just put on a big enough show and last a little longer and smile and nod to everybody in and out of church, that eventually, you know, that stuff will just go away, that I'll be back in right relationship with God. No, you know, it's not, it's not that. Sometimes if we just, you know, think if we just minimize it and, you know, I'm not as bad as, as others and this kind of thing, we compare ourselves to one another, that that's going to sum up. No, that's not going to help us. Or sometimes we think if we just beat ourselves up enough and make sure we feel bad enough about what we have done, then somehow that's going to get us back into a right place with God. If we just heap guilt on ourselves as if he didn't already take the punishment on the cross for us, as if he did not already die for the penalty of sins, we're just going to punish ourselves and hope that that somehow gets us right with God. No. God says, just repent. <laughs> it's amazing that he still pursues us wherever we're at and invites us. That re repent is, is it's an invitation. And it's not nearly as complicated as we make it. I think it involves confession, confession, homo legeo, the Greek word. Say the same word, say the same thing as God. When, when we say confess our sins, when 1 John says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and purify us from all unrighteousness, he's just saying, just agree with God about your sin. Just agree with God, yep. I have done it. It is wrong. I agree with you that what I'm doing is wrong, but not your best for me. There's an agreement. There's a confession to repentance. I think there's a commitment as well that's implied. That there's an aim that God wants us to have. Where as we confess our sin and agree with him about it, now we aim for righteousness. We, we aim for the right thing. We aim for the right. We might not even know what it is yet, but we're going to aim our hearts in that direction. We're afraid to do that because we think we're going to fail and have to do it again. We're afraid sometimes to do this repentance because we think, oh, no, what if I mess up again? 
Forget that. Guess what? When we mess up again, God's going to give an invitation again. Repent again. I'm patient. I'm with you. I'm for you. This is how I grow Christians. <laughs> Through this process <laughs> of speaking and you hearing and responding. And so the question, simple question as we close, what decision is Jesus calling you to make? 2,000 years later, he's still speaking to his church. What is the Spirit of God saying to you? Usually God's telling me, Mike, you gotta, you got to stop doing something. Or, hey, you better start doing something. And often it's a little bit of both. So what is Jesus asking you to stop doing? Or what is he asking you to start doing? What is the Spirit of God speaking to you? We're going to sing this song, We Fall Down. And that's the question I want you to think about. Don't just sing along. I mean, you can, but just what, you know, we've been in this for seven weeks. What's Jesus saying to you? What decision is he calling you to make today? today, yes or no? Yes. yes. Do we believe that he's called us to be not just hearers, but doers of his word? Yes or no? Yes. And so what's it look like for us? What's it look like for you? Yeah, I, I just want to invite you even, let's just close our eyes and you might want to express something of this prayer right now in your heart to the Lord. There's no magic formula here, but you might want to say something like, Lord Jesus, I see again who you are. And Lord, I agree with you about my sin. And Lord, I'm going to aim for something better. Forgive me, Lord. Hear my heart. Hear my cry. Enable me to walk more rightly with way that you just rejoice in me. Thank you for loving me and inviting me into that. Now church, I don't, I don't know where you're at, but I know this isn't something we're supposed to do on our own, so I know once in a while we 
people involved, our prayer team, we call it. I'm going to invite the members of our prayer team here today to just kind of position yourselves around the sanctuary. Um, some in the back, I believe. Some up front here. Prayer team, if you could position yourselves. And what we want to do is just give you a chance. If, if God's speaking to your heart, don't do this alone. Have someone, have someone pray with you before you go. Just find someone. Come forward. I'll be here. I see Wayne in the back. I see Mike and Abraham over here. I think there's some back there. Here comes Gilbert. Let me just find someone. Ask him to pray for you. So Bob over here getting ready. You know, this isn't, anytime churches do this, this is not a time to look around and say, oh, there's the unspiritual ones. <laughs> or, oh, there's the super spiritual ones. No. It's not some spiritual hierarchy. This is just what Christians do. They hear the word, they respond, and they get some people praying for them because they know they can't do it on their own. So these guys are going to sing at least one more song, and maybe two. And this is just a time for you to come and get some prayer in that decision that Jesus is calling you to make. Let's do that now together. Let's be the church. Come out of sadness from wherever you've been. Come brokenhearted. Let rescue begin. Come find your mercy, O oh sinner, come kneel. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can heal. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can heal.
keep speaking to us through your word. And keep making us more like you, Jesus. And though whatever the needs are represented in here, we just close in this way because we just want to say that we're coming together, Lord, to you. That this is not a race we're meant to run on our own. And Lord, to whatever extent we have tried to do this on our own, Lord, we repent from that. Lord, we say we just want to be the church that is the church that invites our brothers and sisters, Lord, into what you're doing in our lives. And grows together, Lord, to the church that you call us to. What a beautiful day that it is. Lord, even when you're fresh in us, even when you're present, even when it's hard, Lord, you're making new wine. You're making new wine to pour out of our lives and pour out of this church. God, we thank you that's just what you do. And Lord, we commit ourselves to you. We aim ourselves towards you. And we thank you for the journey you've led us on in Jesus' name. song, and uh, God bless you. In the crushing, in the pressing, you are